Hi, I'm Mark Cleghorn and welcome to my series with Experience Wedding. And today we're looking at the three tips um, for getting started with wedding photography. So like all things, wedding photography is a bit of a pressure cooker. And um, unlike most genres of photography, there basically is a very easy option to get sued if you get it wrong. So obviously all these tips are designed to actually encourage you to learn not only the basics, but understand the whole genre of wedding photography before you kind of dip your toe into the water, before fully immersing yourself with a 20-foot dive off a 100-foot cliff. <laughs> uh, whatever way you want to get into wedding photography, you need to start somewhere, and I hope it's going to be with these films. So uh, tip one. Um, Basically, obviously, when we're starting off with a business, we've got to decide on our business name and we've got to get associated online and social domain links as well with it. So some photographers think that um, their name is actually the least important thing. To begin with, it's important to understand exactly who you're trying to attract in and if your ambitions are to becoming much more than your own name. In a world of wedding photography, personalization in individuality as well can be something that can really benefit you in actually going under, i.e. the Mark Cleghorn um, or the John Smith or whoever you would be. Why? Um, because basically you're selling a very, very personal service. So when you kind of choose a name out like Experience Wedding, let's say, uh, you've got to really think that that is a brand. So it's a name to the business that is unidentifying you as the person behind it. So when you start to actually really develop your personal nature within a business, you've got to decide if you move away from your own name, uh, basically people are just going to be associating you to a number, a logo, a name uh, on a, a business header. You know, once upon a time, the name of Kodak meant nothing. Then it became synonymous with the world of photography. Uh, but today, because of its uh, uh, disappearance it basically once more has become an iconic brand rather than actually uh, an, a name that means anything but to me it'll always mean photography so you have to make sure that when you do choose your business name it's for a reason and if you want to move away from your own name because it's too complicated a bit like some um, actors and singers do they take on a pseudonym for it but make sure it has a reason Make sure as well that you're going to avoid the kind of the quirky, silly uh, kind of names. Why? Because basically what you're trying to do is obviously give a client confidence in booking you to begin with. And even that confidence is the first appearance, that first thing that people kind of uh, assess you on. And that might be your name. Uh, on a website or your brand on a, lo a logo. So it's very, very important that you use whatever is right for you. Um, it's no longer just a domain name, of course. Um, you've also got to look for the social domain names that actually go alongside it. So you might have come with, up with an absolutely genius uh, idea for a name. Um, however, if the URL is not available, what's the point? Because you're probably going to have a very, very long-winded URL to get somebody to actually be able to type it in. Okay, in a world of QR codes now, it's much sim simpler to use a QR to access uh, somebody's uh, links. Um, but again, if you've got a name like Mark Cleghorn, super duper wonderful wedding photography, try getting the URL for that. It's going to be available. That's why it's a stupid URL. So if it's available, second guess yourself and go, hang on a minute, I might be getting this all wrong. So let's simplify everything. So when you decide on your wedding business name, I would suggest that unless there's a real reason for it, you keep it to your own name itself. So remember, you're going to need your web domain, your Facebook, your Instagram, and your Twitter. Probably they're not all going to be available, so there might be some deviation. But as long as you're in from the beginning with all of those social feeds, then at least you know as well how you're going to be promoting it in all the literature that you're going to be doing. Number two tip is making sure you have the right gear. Um, now, photographers, whether they're girls or boys, basically love toys. And so, you know, ooh, bright, shiny lens, ooh, bright, shiny body, ooh, bright, shiny flash, and we go off and actually kind of buy all this stuff. But at the end of the day, as a photographer of weddings, you've definitely got to carry you uh, the right equipment for the right uh, set setups and style that you're actually doing. And of course, making sure you're, you're not looking a bit like a 
pack horse trying to climb up a mountain so minimizing the amount of equipment that you're taking with you to maximize your flexibility and speed during the course of the wedding itself as far as uh, lens choice is concerned uh, many of you will opt for uh, zoom lenses uh, because they're lenses of convenience rather than lenses of quality um, there are exceptions to the rule there are some absolutely super lenses out there like a 70 to 200 lens um, basically that is your all-round lens if you're a kind of reportage photographer for the distance shots but I can pretty much guarantee a reportage photographer will have something like a 20 mil, 24 mil, 35 mil, 50 mil in their bag as well. Uh, and often, or more often than not, they're going to be a prime lens because of the quality of the picture. So even though as far as the lens choice is concerned, you would think, well, in fact, two lenses, a 24 to 105 and a 70 to 200, they're the two lenses that I'm going to use on a wedding. And that's basically what you're going to uh, kind of get your images with but are they just as I said lenses of convenience rather than lenses of dynamic so just think about uh, the difference between when you zoom with a lens compared with a prime lens uh, and actually the way that the glass and the depth of field react so in other words my 24 to 105 Canon lens and if I've got it on a 50 mil at f4 it will give me a totally different look and feel in the depth of feel with a prime lens a uh, 50 mil prime lens at f4 completely different look and feel so make sure you're using the right lens for the job but only you can be telling yourself that i know there's a lot of uh, kind of moving over to the mirrorless because of weight issues and so on but same thing is you know weight in your hand is giving you some stability instead of the lightness and the featherness um, if you can't cope with the likes of the weights of the lenses or the weights of the camera uh, the camera look at the likes of the, uh, a monopod especially with a long lens to give you some support when it's not in use as well as some support when you're shooting but it will give you a little bit more stag uh, stagnation like a, a sports photographer or an event photographer has as well but lens choice for me is absolutely essential to make sure it's with a style and I would always prefer where possible to use a prime before a medium zoom lens. Uh, reflectors, um, an absolute must for me on a wedding. Uh, reflector is fold, uh, fold away rather than a, a per permanent size. I tend to use the triangular tri-grip style um, because they're easy to hold in my hand and I can shoot one-handed using the reflector to manipulate the light so it basically bends the light a little bit more in the direction that I want it to be. But a reflector will bring accent to the face or to the body or to something in the scene uh, compared to just the natural light that falls on to the, sub uh, the subject. More often than not, I'm always photographing with the, uh, the light behind the client. So in other words, the sun is shining into my lens, just to give you an example. Uh, and that gives me a natural kind of uh, separation light around the couple, a natural rim light, which means if I use uh, my, my reflector in my hand or I've got somebody to hold it for me and they're using it high, it becomes almost like a studio flash quality where they're bouncing the light back into the scene, back onto the subject's face. So a reflector for me is always natural light before reflector, reflector before flash, flash is a last resort. Flash units, um, obviously you've got to make sure they're absolutely right for you. So if you're a photographer that loves to shoot a lot of off-camera flash, um, obviously you've got to buy more intelligent flash and check out our series with off-camera flash on the Photographer Academy as well, of course. Um, but if you're using speed light on camera, uh, just the whole time, a flash on camera the whole time, I would ask you to question why are you not switching it off? You know, there is times to use flash and there's times not to use flash. For me on a wedding, the main choice of flash is going to be when there is no light and I have to use it in a scene that I need to freeze the uh, the motion, uh, capture the, mo uh, the moment, filling in a little bit of information but that might not be for all the photographs that just might be for a few of the photographs like signing the register when I'm doing a group and they're looking at camera I'm probably going to be using flash on camera or flash in hand just to illuminate the scene and give me a lovely flood of light however when they're looking down whether it's just a couple or a group uh, I'm just going to try and use all the ambient light within the scene instead of kind of just killing all the ambience with flash 
when I'm working with groups on location, of course, I've already said that most of the time I'm working against the sun, so I need to put direct light going in into them to make sure I've got filling in of the con uh, the contrast, uh, as well as putting some specular kind of highlights within in the catch lights of the eye. So thinking about why you're using flash um, and how often you're using flash. So if you find yourself being a winter wedding photographer and uh, you've got to use flash at some stage, then how sophisticated can you get with your flash to allow your photographs to actually stand out from the crowd? So often if I'm shooting a winter wedding or the kind of location is very dark, I'll take along studio, a studio flash or portable flash like the Elencrom ELB 400 and I can put that on a stand with an, um, an umbrella and actually create some amazing kind of looking light within a scene um, uh, instead of actually just relying on the dull uh, the dullness coming off a room light and so on and then pretty much uh, as far as the kit for the gear and the day is concerned uh, enough store storage uh, I know you kind of might look at the uh, compact flash cards and SD cards and so on and basically look at it and think well, okay well you know what uh, I'm just going to buy a few really big cards and that'll kind of cover everything for the wedding uh, in fact, for myself, I don't like to shoot above a 32 gig card um, because I like to char change the, uh, the storage card during the course of the day to make sure I've got a variety. Uh, should, God forbid, anything happen to a card, not all of my wedding is on the one card. And, and by the way, uh, before I go out onto the wedding, I format all the cards on camera, so I'm always shooting with a clean card. Uh, I never delete an image on the card on the day um, because I don't want to actually even try and instigate any corruption of that card no matter what. But remember I come back from the days of old, days of film and then obviously moving on to uh, uh, the likes of uh, digital. But in the days of digital when we're working in 2 million pic pixels and then upwards in quality we couldn't afford for any mistakes especially with moving drives uh, which is very important. So making sure that all kind of hangs together. Um, and then the, the last thing about um, uh, s starting a wedding business up really is trying to spread the word as fast as you can, as quick as you can. So make sure that uh, you contact all wedding companies around you and all the services in your area and all the, ved the vendors trying to get literature and samples into their venues as soon as you can, as well as start a relationship going because you're probably going to be in this for the long term, which means you need to actually make friends uh, rather than enemies right at the beginning of your career. So those are three quick tips for you to actually look at starting a wedding photography business and making sure that you start your path on the right way. And this is the, uh, one of the films in our Experience Weddings series. Hope you enjoyed it. See you on the next one.